All right, we're going to cover the last section here, Doppler and hemodynamics. Let's start with uh, hemodynamics. So when we're talking about hemodynamics, we're talking about fluid flow. And flow is just simply the movement of a fluid from one location to another. We call this the volume flow rate. And the units for this is volume per time, or generally liters per minute. Um, and so that is the entire flow that is moving across a point. The velocity is what we measure with ultrasound. So velocity gives us speed and direction of the blood and tells us how fast it's moving. There's a couple of types of flow that we want to think about. A steady flow is the fluid movement at a constant speed or velocity. So if you turn on your water tap, you're going to see steady flow coming out of the water supply. Um, if we suspend respiration, this is what we see in venous flow. The portal venous system is nearly steady state flow because it's going between two organs with no uh, pumping action between them. However, the portal venous flow is very susceptible to um, changes in the pressure of the liver and so you do see some fluctuation in the portal flow but it's probably the most steady state flow in the body. Pulsatile flow is what we see coming from the heart so arterial blood flow would be considered pulsatile and phasic flow is flow that results from respiration and so most venous flow that you see is phasic flow though as you get to the veins closer to the central portion of the system near the heart, you will see some phasic flow changes in those also. There's a couple of flow velocity profiles we need to be concerned about. One is called laminar flow and this is layered blood flow or organized blood flow in which the blood flow along the sides of the vessel are slow because of friction and so the blood flow getting closer to the center of the vessel is the fastest. We see laminar blood flow in cases where we have long steady um, flow that occurs um, typically in a long vessel with slow, um, you know, towards the end of the heart rate in the diastolic flow. Laminar flow lines are usually streamlined and parallel is how you can think about them. So parabolic flow is a very normal steady state flow as opposed to plug flow which occurs during acceleration. So anytime there's acceleration either due to a stenosis or simply because the heart is contracting you will see plug flow. And so plug flow is demonstrated on our ultrasound by a very narrow Doppler spectra. By narrow I mean a very um, from top to bottom the spectra is very close together. Anytime you have laminar flow you're dealing with flow that produces a Reynolds number under 1500. The important thing about Reynolds number is you only need to know that it is a unitless number and under 1500 is laminar flow and over 2000 is going to be turbulent flow and turbulent flow is chaotic flow in all directions and speeds. It has no streamlines. A great amount of energy is lost in turbulent flow due to inertial losses um, and you also end up with sound being created uh, due to vibration and eddy currents, that's the swirling around of blood, also occurs and so those are all things that cause energy losses. Usually turbulent flow in the human body is associated with the pathologic condition, what we call a critical stenosis. And as I said, the Reynolds number is going to be over 2000. Blood flows because there's an energy gradient between different locations. 
normally we identify this energy gradient as a difference in pressure but it can also be due to a difference in velocity of the blood so it just is the energy the total energy has to be higher in the proximal portion of the flow than in the distal there's three forms of energy loss there's frictional which is the conversion of energy into heat which occurs with the blood sliding along the vessel wall um, there's viscosity this is the thickness of the blood itself and results to the blood sticking to itself and this is um, seen with elevated hematocrits uh, you can think of a viscosity as something like honey has a high viscosity and alcohol or water has low viscosity and then the other the main type of energy loss is inertial energy loss and so we remember that an object in motion tends to stay in motion and an object at rest tends to stay at rest and it requires a force to change that condition and so the changes of motion and no motion is where most of the energy loss in the body occurs so let's talk quickly about energy there's several types that we're going to consider with hemodynamics there's kinetic energy and this is the energy of the blood in motion there's potential energy and in blood this is what we call the blood pressure and then there's gravitational energy and this is a form of energy that is due to the height that the blood is above the, the feet or above or below the heart actually flow occurs anytime the energy gradient exists between two points and as I said this can be either due to kinetic or potential energy and generally in the body we see it between uh, potential energy with pressure let's talk a little more about the energy losses in circulation so we said they were viscosity frictional and inertial losses and viscosity loss is determined by the hematocrit and blood must overcome this energy due to its own thickness this is measured in units of poise and you could think of viscosity as trying to pull blood or a milkshake through a straw other energy losses are frictional energy losses and so frictional energy losses occur when objects slide along one another and generate heat such as blood sliding along a vessel wall or in this case an arm sliding along a road created a fric frictional loss of some skin and no that's not my arm that's uh, somebody else's inertial energy losses are from when objects tend to stay in motion they remain in motion with inertial energy losses the tendency of fluid to resist changes in velocity this occurs during pulsatile flow from the heart beating and resting and beating and in phasic flow due to respiration we also see it with velocity changes at a stenosis when blood changes direction and becomes turbulent we mentioned Reynolds number earlier and again all you need to know about Reynolds number is simply if it's 1500 or less it's laminar flow and if it's over 2000 it is uh, turbulent flow let's talk about what happens at a stenosis a stenosis for our purposes is the narrowing of the lumen of a vessel it has an effect on the blood flow in that it changes its velocity due to Bernoulli's principle which causes the increase in velocity if there's enough narrowing past the stenosis we often will see post stenotic turbulence if it is a critical stenosis with the post stenotic turbulence we see a loss of streamlines eddy currents and vortices within the blood flow will appear and flow energy gets converted into sound or tissue vibration when this occurs we call it a brewy or a thrill there's a decreased pressure gradient across the vessel 
and the pulsatile flow becomes a steady state flow due to the loss of the cardiac activity. Bernoulli's principle, as I said, causes a increase in the velocity of the blood going across the stenosis. And Bernoulli's principle basically states that all the energies is the same everywhere across the stenosis. This applies to all steady state flow or applies only to steady state flow. Therefore, some portions of Bernoulli's principle really don't seem to apply because we mostly have pulsatile flow in the body. However, we do see increased velocities um, due to the narrowing and we attribute this to Bernoulli's principle. Let's discuss what happens with the relationship between pressure and flow. Volumetric flow, as we said, is the entire flow across a point in the blood, is directly related to the pressure differences, what we call delta P. It's indirectly related to the resistance to the flow. So flow goes up if the pressure goes up, if the change in pressure goes up, and flow goes down if the resistance goes up. This tells us that the pressure gradient increases when flow increases or resistance increases, but more importantly, flow increases when pressure increases and resistance decreases. Many people consider this to be analogous to Ohm's law, where fluid movement is analogous to electrical current movement. So the pressure gradient equals flow times resistance. With Ohm's law, the voltage equals current times resistance. In this case, pressure is analogous to voltage and current is analogous to flow. Resistance in the arterial system is controlled by the arterioles. So when the arterioles are constricted, resistance goes up. Why is Ohm's law important for sonographers? Well, very simply, Ohm's law is important for sonographers because this analogy tends to show up on the SPI exam. Let's discuss venous hemodynamics now. Veins in their normal state have low pressure. They're very collapsible and usually only partially filled with blood. Normal state of veins, their cross-sectional shape is flattened in somewhat of a figure eight shape. With increased flow, the roundness of the vessel continues increasing until it is completely full. Once it's full, then it is very difficult to change the volume flow without a huge change in pressure. Hydrostatics is the pressure caused by gravity. The reference point for this is the right atrium, which is considered the lowest point of pressure in the body. We can determine hydrostatic pressure times uh, with the equation that shows that it is the density times the acceleration due to gravity times the height of the column of blood. The units are typically millimeters of mercury. When people are laying flat, hydrostatic pressure is essentially negligible. It is the same throughout the body. When standing, hydrostatic pressure affects the overall venous pressure greatly. Ankle pressure will increase with standing, and with exercise and what we call the uh, venous muscle pump, the venous pressure in the legs lowers. Changes in pressure change the pressure gradient and therefore change the blood flow. Let's look at venous dynamics at rest. Changes in the intrathoracic and intra-abdominal pressure will affect the venous return to the heart. During inspiration, the diaphragm descends 
and the pressure decreases in the chest cavity. This will cause blood to pool in the pulmonary vascular bed. It also tends to pull air into the lungs. We call that breathing. This does increase the intra-abdominal pressure and flow from the legs at this point will be impeded and we'll see less flow in the legs. During expiration, however, the diaphragm ascends, the abdominal pressure decreases, and flow from the legs into the abdomen increases. The pressure increases in the chest cavity, and blood flow is then decreased into the thorax. So we can think of venous dynamics as increased pressure on expiration in the chest and increased pressure on inspiration in the legs or flow occurs more readily with inspiration above the diaphragm and less readily with inspiration below the diaphragm and just the opposite with expiration. So with breathing and venous flow we want to summarize it with venous flow in the legs correlates with the movement of the diaphragm. Downward movement of the diaphragm slows down the flow in the legs. Upward movement of the diaphragm speeds up flow in the legs. Venous flow above the diaphragm is just the opposite. All right, let's get to Doppler. Doppler is our last subject to this, and so let's see what it says. So what is the Doppler shift? This is known as the Doppler frequency. And this occurs when sound and the receiver are moving closer together or farther apart. It does not occur when they are moving relative to each other at the same rate. This is the principle that we're going to use to measure the velocity of the blood in the body. The Doppler shift in ultrasound is much, much lower than the transducer frequency. If we remember, the transducer frequency is between 2 megahertz and 20 megahertz, and the Doppler frequency is usually between 20 to about 14,000 hertz, which is significant because that is the same frequency as audible sound. For example, a transmitted wave might be 5 megahertz si signal. The received wave will be only a small percentage changed from that, or 5 million, 3,000 hertz, and so the Doppler shift would then be 3,000 hertz. The Doppler shift is equal to the reflected frequency minus the transmitted frequency. Doppler shifts are created when sound strikes moving blood cells. Positive shifts occur when the blood is moving toward the transducer, and negative shifts occur when the blood is moving away from the transducer. So when we look at the Doppler direction, when we talk about the transducer, we're talking about if this is our insonation path, this is the portion of the transducer we're concerned about, and this is where we're measuring in the Doppler gate. So Doppler direction, if the blood is moving, in this case, from left to right, then the blood is moving towards the transducer. Speed tells us how fast something is moving. Velocity tells us how fast and the direction that it's moving. With Doppler, we need to know both the speed and the velocity, or simply just the velocity because that gives us the speed in itself. Therefore, if blood is moving in a vessel at an angle, as this shows, 150 degrees, we would say that it is moving away from the transducer and we'd get a lower frequency back from our 
insonation frequency. So we said Doppler is simply the transmitted frequency minus the, or excuse me, the received frequency minus the transmitted frequency. So what is this equation that we get? Well, this is the Doppler frequency, delta F, and it is showing that delta F, that same Doppler frequency, is equal to twice the original frequency, or the transmitted frequency, times the velocity of the blood times the cosine theta, divided by the speed of sound in blood, or in the body. So, do we have to know this equation? Yes, this is actually more important than the equation for Doppler of received velocity minus transmitted velocity, because this tells us exactly what we can change if we're having issues with our Doppler frequency. We, we can change, the only two things we can change are the transmitted frequency and the angle that we're insinating at. But let's get into that later. So the Doppler frequency, delta F is the frequency shift, also known as the Doppler frequency. Two is from the round trip effect, because we're sending sound into the blood and getting it, having it echo and come back. F0 is the transmit frequency, or the center frequency of our transducer that we're using for the Doppler measurement. C, of course, is the speed of sound in the soft tissue. We use 1540 meters per second for that. V is the velocity of the blood itself. And then cosine theta is the cosine of the angle between the ultrasound beam, measuring the Doppler signal, and the blood flow direction. We call that the insonation angle. With the Doppler equation, the relationship between the transmit frequency and the Doppler shift, the higher the frequency, the greater the Doppler shift. If we double our transmit frequency, we double that Doppler shift. If we half the frequency, then this Doppler shift will half, it will go down. The relationship between the transmit frequency and the Doppler angle, when the angle is zero, the cosine theta equals one. When the angle is 90, the cosine of theta equals zero. And when the angle is 60, the cosine is exactly half. For historical reasons, we never take Doppler measurements with angles greater than 60 degrees and the maximum Doppler shift will always occur with an angle of zero degrees. So let's look at the Doppler equation and what we're really interested in is the velocity of the blood. We can take the, the Doppler equation and we can rearrange it algebraically and get this equation where V equals the Doppler shift times the speed of sound in blood divided by twice the transmit frequency divided by the cosine of theta. The machine measures the Doppler frequency directly from the signal received. So it, can, it determines delta F, the Doppler frequency, simply by the received frequency minus the transmitted frequency. If we remember from our wave interactions, this is known as the beat frequency from the difference in the frequencies. What we're interested, of course, is the velocity of the blood, and so we rearrange the equation and we solve for velocity, and this is what the machine spits out on our scales. So when we look at the velocity shift, the frequency shift versus velocity, the frequency shift, as we said, was the transmit or the received frequency minus the transmit frequency, and that's given in kilohertz. On this machine, we can put that scale on the left side, and the velocity scale, which is in centimeters per second, is on the right side here, and that tells us how fast the blood is moving. So this blood is moving at approximately uh, 70 centimeters per second, or just under 70 centimeters per second, and it has a velocity shift, or a Doppler shift, of just over 1.5 kilohertz. Remember, this 
is known also as the beat frequency. This is useful diagnostic information. So when we look at the sound beam direction and the flow direction, when the sound is parallel to the flow, the entire frequency shift is obtained. At any other angle, the frequency shift is diminished. The percentage of diminution is calculated by the cosine, and the angle is the direction of incination to the direction of the Doppler or the blood flow. At 90 degrees, we'd be going directly across the vessel, and there would be no frequency shift. So here is showing you the normal 60 degree angle of incination where this line represents the incination and the blood flow of course is parallel to the angle corrector. Our machine then gives us the velocity of the blood which is 66 centimeters per second. This is the same patient, and in this case we've adjusted the angle so that it is only 50 instead of 60, and we're seeing that the velocity is very much the same, 64 uh, centimeters per second. But if you look carefully, let's go back to the first one. In this case, our frequency shift was 1.5 kilohertz. And in the second case, we can see the frequency shift is getting up much closer to 2. If we continue to decrease the angle of incination, or the angle between the blood and our incination line, to 45 degrees, we can see that we're now getting a frequency shift well over 2 kilohertz, but our blood velocity is still relatively the same measure of 70 uh, centimeters per second. So the velocity is staying the same even though the angle is changing. So the Doppler shift is very much related to the cosine of theta. Mathematically, the Doppler shift is, is um, best when theta is zero. At 180 degrees, it is the same as if it was zero, but just moving in the opposite direction. At a 60 degree angle, the frequency shift is only half of its maximum. So anytime you're measuring at 60 degrees, you're only seeing half of the Doppler spectrum. Bidirectional Doppler, which means that we can see the, the direction of the flow with our machines, is done by something known as a quadrature phase detector. When in practice what happens is when we're listening to our Doppler shift on our machines, flow in one direction goes out one speaker and flow in the other is directed towards the other speaker so you can actually hear the change in direction with your ultrasound machine. Visually, we describe this by showing it on the spectral, the spectrum on the display. When the spectrum is above the baseline, we say that is in one direction, usually towards the transducer. And then when the spectrum is below the baseline, we say that is the opposite direction, usually away from the direction. But certainly the operator can determine if the direction is toward or away by inverting the flow. Flow detection in an ultrasound system is determined by the phase quadrature detector. What do you need to know about a phase quadrature detector? It determines the flow in an ultrasound system. That's all you need to know. Flow direction, I should say. With continuous wave Doppler, we have to have two crystals in order to do continuous wave Doppler. One is always transmitting and the other one is constantly receiving. 
The advantage of continuous wave Doppler is that we can detect very high velocities with no aliasing. The disadvantage is that we don't know the exact location that the blood flow is coming from, and we cannot adjust for uh, compensate for depth, and we can't get an image. That's the biggest problem, is there's no imaging with continuous wave. With continuous wave transducers, these are very easy to make. They're relatively cheap. They have no backing material, so they are very, very sensitive to detecting signal. They have a very narrow bandwidth and a very high quality factor. They have high sensitivity due to the no backing material and are able to detect very low signals. One advantage of the continuous wave transducers is their ability to detect very small Doppler frequency shifts. With duplex imaging though, we get the advantage of having imaging plus our spectral Doppler. So this is known as simultaneous anatomic imaging and Doppler, or more commonly known as duplex imaging. Technically, anytime there are two modes on the screen, it's duplex, so you can have M mode plus an image, you can have Doppler plus an image, you can have color plus the grayscale image, and they're all duplex imaging. However, most people consider duplex imaging what you see here with an anatomic image in one portion of the screen and the spectral Doppler at the, on another portion. And this is what you, most people will say is duplex imaging. So don't try to confuse anybody. Pulse wave Doppler is the Doppler that we utilize to obtain our spectral display at the bottom of a duplex image uses pulses like pulsed imaging technique, typically uses one crystal for doing this, and it alternates between a transmit and a receive mode. So pulse wave Doppler can be done with simply one crystal. The advantage is that we can get good range specificity. We know the depth that our Doppler signal is coming from. The disadvantage is we can get aliasing with high velocities high velocity blood flow, so just be aware of that. With pulse wave Doppler we always have what's known as a sample volume or a gate. With a sample volume the Doppler signal is only listened to during the time that the sound passes through this gate. Only echoes created at the gate are processed along this particular insonation line that is causing the Doppler signal. So anything along this line, the only thing we are interested in is what's in the gate. And that's the only time the machine listens to the sound that is reflected along this insonation line. With pulse wave Doppler transducers, these are capable of both imaging and Doppler analysis, which makes it very useful. We can see exactly where we're getting our Doppler signal. These have the characteristics of always containing a backing material, so they have less sensitivity than continuous wave. Remember, imaging is always considered a low quality, a low Q type transducer, and they have a wide bandwidth. The disadvantage to um, using a pulse wave Doppler is that you can have aliasing. Aliasing is the most common error in Doppler ultrasound. This is when high velocities are incorrectly displayed as going in the opposite direction. So here we see a spectral Doppler with the high velocities cut off at the top and displayed on the bottom, which normally would be the opposite direction. This top of our screen here is known as the Nyquist limit. The fact that these are coming through on the bottom where it would be flow away from the transducer is aliasing and as we know that aliasing um, this flow would not be going backwards it would still be going forward at a high velocity. 
So aliasing only occurs with pulse Doppler, never with continuous wave. It occurs when the sample rate is too low. It's important to remember the sample rate for our Doppler is our PRF, our pulse repetition frequency. That is the exact same as the sample rate. So when the Doppler shift exceeds the Nyquist limit, aliasing occurs. The Nyquist limit is the highest Doppler shift that can occur without aliasing. And we define the Nyquist limit as the pulse repetition frequency divided by 2. Alright, I'm going to take a minute here to try to explain how the Doppler shift works so that um, you can sort of visualize uh, how this sample frequency what, what it's about. So if we think of the Doppler shift as a frequency, which it is, so typically it's around uh, let's say a thousand kilohertz, we can draw that as a oops, as a wave as we draw any other frequency wave. So here we go. And I'm going to just draw it as a sine wave and say that it's um, going to be 12 or 1000 uh, hertz or 1 kilohertz. Okay. So if we were to sample this with our pulse repetition frequency, our PRF, we can take samples of it and if we take enough samples then the computer can then reconstruct the sound wave, it can digitize it and determine that it, with enough samples we get something that looks somewhat like our original Doppler shift frequency and it we can then count the frequency shift and determine exactly what it is and this is what the computer does and so this is sampling at uh, let's see if this is one two three waves here we have six sample parts so we've uh, sampled twice as much as we have um, wave or our PRF is twice our uh, Doppler shift now, what happens if we don't sample enough? This is aliasing when our PRF is too low. If, we, if our PRF is too low, we don't have enough samples, then we end up with a frequency reconstruction that is nothing like what the original frequency was. So this is aliasing. So we have to have a PRF high enough to where we have enough samples to recreate the wave electronically or digitally. And when we do that, It gives us something of the shape of the wave and then the computer can calculate by knowing the peaks exactly what the frequency shift is. <clears throat> and so if you have a thousand hertz um, wave or Doppler shift, you need a 2000 hertz PRF in order to correctly image that to correctly calculate it. So aliasing occurs when the pulse repetition frequency is greater or less than twice the Doppler shift or the Doppler shift must be the pulse repetition frequency divided by 2. So to avoid aliasing we either have to raise our pulse repetition frequency or reduce our Doppler shift. We can raise the pulse repetition frequency by increasing the scale on the machine, 
on some machines this is called the PRF, others it's called the scale, the scale control for the Doppler. We can lower our Doppler shift by reducing the insonation frequency or by increasing the angle of insonation. But because the PRF is related to the depth of our image, sometimes when the sample volume depth is shallow, the PRF can be very high and we're not going to see aliasing. But we run into a problem when we get a deep sample volume and our image structures are very deep and we're trying to detect a Doppler frequency deep in the body. This is when aliasing is more likely to occur. So tip, to sum it up, less aliasing occurs when we have slow blood velocity, if we have low uh, frequency transducers, and if we're using a shallow sample gate. More aliasing occurs when we have faster blood velocity with higher frequency, transmitted frequencies and a deep sample gate. So to control aliasing, we can, one, either maximize the scale, adjust our PRF. This will raise the Nyquist limit. It also reduces the sensitivity to low velocity, so be very careful. If you're not seeing blood flow, check your scale. It may be too high. In some cases, though, aliasing will still persist even though we've maxed out our scale. The other thing we can do is use a new window with a shallower sample volume. This allows us to increase the PRF, but of course this only works when an alternative window exists. Third thing we can do is select a lower frequency transducer. This will decrease our Doppler shift, but of course it reduces image quality, and in some cases the, re <coughs> the signal reflection from Raleigh scatters is decreased to the point to where we can't detect the Doppler shift. And then fourth, sometimes there's just simply a baseline shift that needs to be done. What a baseline shift is, is when the um, duplex scale displayed on the screen is uh, up too high. And sometimes we can just lower that scale and have less negative velocities and more positive velocities. And that can show us the um, Doppler shift without aliasing. Of course, this only changes the display of the signal. It doesn't actually remove any real aliasing that occurs. The fifth thing we can do to adjust aliasing is to use continuous wave Doppler. With continuous wave, you'll never have aliasing. The disadvantage, of course, is that we end up with range ambiguity and no image. And then a sixth thing we can do is use less angle of insonation. This gives us the advantage of decreasing the Doppler shift. It improves signal strength, but it has the disadvantage of we can only go to 60 degrees. Beyond 60 degrees, we are not allowed to take an, a, a Doppler measurement. And this may not be possible within the acoustic window that we're given. So summarizing pulse versus continuous wave ultrasound, with pulsed ultrasound, which we typically use, we get range resolution, we have a sample volume, there's limited maximum velocity, and we get aliasing. It requires only one transducer, it has a low Q factor, wide bandwidth, but lower sensitivity. With continuous wave, there's always range ambiguity. There's never aliasing. It requires two crystals. They're undampened, so we get a high Q factor and very high sensitivity. Let's look at our spectral display. With our spectral display, we have multiple shades of gray on the Doppler spectrum. These gray shades are related to the 
amplitude of the reflected signal. <clears throat> Another way to say that is that the number of blood cells creating the reflection is related to the brightness of the gray on the display. The x-axis indicates the velocity or speed and the, the x-axis indicates the time and the y-axis indicates the velocity or speed. With color Doppler we get velocity information that we then superimpose over the grayscale anatomic image. Color Doppler uses pulsed ultrasound technique and therefore has range resolution. It is very subject to aliasing, but it's much less angle dependent than spectral Doppler. Color Doppler always displays an average velocity, never the peak velocity. Therefore, Color Doppler will always be show lower velocity scales than the spectrum. Let's talk about the color maps that are involved. There's two different color maps that we use. One is a velocity scale, which only shows, uh, varies vertically. And the other is a velocity variance scale, which varies vertically and horizontally. On a velocity variance map, the left side indicates laminar flow, and the right side indicates colors associated with turbulent flow. Velocity scales can be considered as dictionaries or lookup tables. The colors indicate the direction. Any color above the blue, the black stripe, is considered toward the transducer. Any color below the black stripe is considered away from the transducer. Colors that are closest to the black stripe indicate slower velocities, and the change of hue increases indicates increasing velocity. So the darker colors are slow and the brighter colors are typically faster. The center region in the black where the black stripe is, is our color wall filter. So the thickness of this black band is the color wall filter. When we do a sector image of color, we can't angle the color box. So it's very important to find out what direction the color is indicating flow direction. So we always look at our color map, try to identify flow toward the transducer, in this case it is displayed as red, and flow away from the transducer is blue. In order to determine direction, place your finger on toward color and move to away color. This is the direction of the flow. So, if we put our finger on the red and move to the blue, we see in the bottom vessel here the flow is moving from right to left. Oops, wrong button there. In our top vessel, flow towards red, red, flow away blue, so we move from toward to away blue, and so our flow in a top vessel is from left to right. The thin black line between the two colors is where the flow is essentially 90 degrees to the transducer and is not showing a direction. When we have a rectangular image or a linear array, we can steer the box in order to determine the blood flow. Usually when it's done correctly, we're going to see only one color of flow in a vessel. <clears throat> so in order to determine the direction of flow, we can do this technique where we draw a line from the co top corner of the box that does not have flow color below it. So this corner, has no flow information below it, whereas this top corner does have flow information below it. So we draw a line down our screen. We're going to call that the home line. 
in this case, flow that is blue is shown, or, yeah, is, is away from the transducer because it's below the black line. So from our home line, we're going to move away from the home line, and that is the direction of the flow. So this blue flow is going from right to left. Doppler color packets are different than regular um, transmitted pulses. So a Doppler color packet is a group of pulses that are utilized to create the Doppler signal. Each color line uses multiple pulses to make its signal. These are called a packet or an ensemble. Larger packets have more pulses and this gives us more accurate velocity measurements and increased sensitivity to slow flow. Has the definite disadvantage though of slowing down our frame rate and requiring more time to obtain the data. When we create a color scan, each line receives multiple packets along that same line. Again, these, oops, let's go back one. These packets is, this packet, these multiple pulses are called the packet or the um, ensemble for the color image. Power Doppler is a type of color imaging. It's also known as energy Doppler or color angio. It simply identifies flow and does not give velocity information or sp of, of any kind, either direction or speed. It only shows the amplitude of the signal, which tells you the number of blood vessels it moving in that direction. The advantage of power Doppler, of course, is that it has this increased sensitivity to low flow, we're able to see small vessels better, we're able to see vessels that are not at the correct Doppler angle better, and it doesn't have any aliasing. The disadvantage, of course, is that it has no velocity direction, no velocity or direction. It doesn't give us any indication of stenosis except for vessel narrowing, which can be very hard to identify. It's extremely susceptible to the motion of the transducer, which causes something called a flash artifact. Flash artifacts are very important to remember with power Doppler because they tend to be a question on the SPI exam. Let's talk about Doppler artifacts. Ghosting or clutter, which is a low frequency Doppler shift caused by tissue movement, I've heard it mostly called wall thump. In color, it's known as ghosting or color bleed. Wall filters are utilized to eliminate clutter or wall thumps and are known as high, high pass filters. So this is a wall thump in a spectral Doppler image, this bright area near the baseline. These are low velocities but very strong signals because literally what's happening is the wall of the vessel is crossing the into the sample gate creating motion. In color this is showing you this, the same thing. This is near the wall showing color uh, ghosting or bleeding. Again, wall filters can be used to eliminate the clutter and are known as high pass filters. High pass means high frequencies pass through, low frequencies are, su are suppressed. With wall filters, there's a control on the panel that we can adjust the high pass filter or the wall filter for spectral. A lot of systems also have a high pass filter for color, but most of them simply utilize the adjustment of the scale for changing the color 
um, base uh, wall filter. So remember the black bar on the the color scale is our color wall filter. The higher the numbers displayed in the color velocity scale um, will have a higher percentage of velocities um, blocked out by the black bar. Therefore by increasing the scale making these numbers bigger on our color velocity scale inherently increases the wall filter for color because this now represents um, higher numbers. In spectral Doppler we have to adjust a wall filter um, that is on the machine and so when we see a wall thump we can increase our wall filter. It removes all low level signals and if we increase it too much it removes a lot of velocity signal information also. So be careful about that. The spectral wall filter selectively eliminates low frequency Doppler shifts near the baseline. It does not in any way affect the appearance of the high velocity signal. Crosstalk is another Doppler artifact. This is associated only with spectral Doppler and in this case the spectrum appears above and below the baseline. This results from too high of gain or oversaturation of the phase quadrature detector or trying to obtain a Doppler angle too close to 90 degrees. Spectral analysis, there's two types of spectral analysis. There's what we call fast Fourier transformation which is utilized when we're creating the Doppler spectrum. This gives us individual frequency components and provides us with a peak Doppler shift or peak velocity. Autocorrelation on the other hand is another type of spectral analysis. It is used for color imaging and it provides only the mean velocity information, not the peak. Early Doppler analysis was done with something known as a zero crossing detector or a chirp Z detector, not to be confused with a chirp transmission. These use time interval histograms which basically just means that it drew a line on a piece of paper. This method, all the zero crossing chirp Z and time interval histograms all utilize mean velocities and do not give us peak velocity measurements. The fast Fourier transformation, transformation utilizes what we call simply FFT which is very accurate. It provides all complex velocity components so we're able to see spectral broadening very well and allows good discrimination between chaotic and laminar flow. If we go back a slide, you can see that these line drawings would not show you chaotic flow. You can't see the velocities underneath the mean velocity tracing. With the fast Fourier transformation, we certainly see spectral broadening and chaotic flow throughout this, the image. So this is non-chaotic flow. This is normal laminar flow. And you can see that in the um, systolic upstroke of the heart, the upstroke of the velocity, this is plug flow. See how narrow the velocity spectrum is in just this portion of the image. When the heart relaxes, then the blood flow starts spreading out and we get the laminar flow and we get wider velocity information. So plug flow, laminar flow, and then above here this is demonstrating turbulent flow uh, post stenosis. Autocorrelation as we said was the method used by color Doppler. It is far less accurate than fast Fourier transformation but is much much faster than fast Fourier transformation and it only provides mean velocity information. 
Let's discuss optimizing color Doppler. Color is displayed directly over the B-mode image of anatomy. Its interpretation may be difficult due to operator variability. The system settings may change colored Doppler images. The image may be pleasing to the eye, but not very diagnostic. Images may be diagnostic, but not be very easy to understand. With normal incidence or 90 degree flow uh, Doppler shift, typically no Doppler shift occurs and very little if any color appears in the color box. We always have to adjust then the incination angle in order to show the color correctly. You always want your incination angle to be minimized between the incination angle and the color flow. So in our top image, our flow is coming straight down and we're getting a very poor Doppler shift due to the poor angulation. In the next image down in the middle, we're getting good image information because we've got our image flow, particularly on the left side here, minimized between our vessel and our Doppler incination angle. In the bottom one, we're angling the incorrect way, and again, at so certain portions of the vessel, we're almost 90 degree, and we're getting a poor Doppler signal. When the Doppler, when the vessel is angled correctly, we get good Doppler information. With a sector scan or curvilinear array, we cannot angle correct the Doppler um, box, the, the Doppler information box. So we have very limited operator controls when doing this. So usually our controls consist of just adjusting the scale and perhaps the priority in order to make a good Doppler image. With Doppler spectral gain, uh, we have ideal too much gain and too little gain. Be sure to keep your gain settings correct. I think this is the difference between objective and subjective. I think anyone can tell that subjectively uh, these are this is a good image, this is a poor image, and this is marginally okay. Less than marginal. Color aliasing occurs when the color Doppler shift exceeds the Nyquist limit. Color wraps around to appear as reverse flow. So as an example, this is red flow towards the transducer and then suddenly it becomes blue flow. Well, if the red flow turns brighter and if the velocity continues to increase, it wraps around and becomes the blue flow. So we always want to decrease our Doppler, or, or increase our velocity scale to get rid of the aliasing in color images. Okay, how do you tell color flow reversal versus aliasing? When aliasing occurs, the color is going directly from red to blue with no black line in between. With reversal, we always will see a thin black line between the colors. And so in this image on the bottom, it is definitely showing you flow reversal rather than aliasing. In the top, it's going directly from red to blue. So it's showing you aliasing instead of flow reversal. To get rid of color aliasing, we can always increase our color scale. This reduces the aliasing, but it always decreases our sensitivity to slow flow by increasing the color wall filter. 
Decreasing the color scale improves our sensitivity to slow flow. It decreases our sensitivity to high velocity small vessel flow in some machines and increases the flash artifact, though it doesn't increase it as much as the gain does. Most machines have a button called color threshold or priority. What the color threshold does is it changes whether or not color is overlaying grayscale information. So our grayscale information in the extreme case here, we've said that the color must be, um, the, the grayscale must be darker than dark in order to show any color. In the one on the top left, we're allowing color to be overlaid on much of this bright tissue, grayscale tissue by simply turning up the priority, or excuse me, turning down the priority, more grayscale is displayed on our image. One of the most confusing things about Doppler imaging is known as high pulse repetition frequency imaging. High PRF imaging employs multiple sample volumes placed at intervals along the Doppler incination line. These sites can be sampled at a faster rate than typical pulse wave Doppler and thus higher pulse repetition frequencies can be used to sample blood velocities which would otherwise cause aliasing. So the multiple lines it only takes a short, we can have a high PRF to get between the transducer and our first sample volume. That same PRF is going between the two sample volumes. In this case we are collecting blood flow information from the first sample volume and the second sample volume is sitting in the patient's spine. So we know that there's no flow from the second sample volume, so all of the displayed flow is from the first. With high pulse repetition frequency scanning, you have to make sure that the two color sample volume boxes, or multiple sample volume boxes, that only one of them, the one that you're interested in collecting the Doppler information from, is in an actual vessel. The others need to be either in soft tissue or just simply outside of vessels. Color Doppler artifacts is when color appears when there's no flow, when no color appears when there is flow, or when the wrong color or shade of flow uh, appears, confusing the direction of the flow velocity. So let's look at these different situations. When there's no color, when there is flow, the color flow is greatly dependent on the intensity of the sound energy reaching the interface. So deep vessels are affected the most and we can correct this by changing our transducer selection, our frequency, and adjusting the controls on the machine, either adjusting the filters, the gain, or the threshold. Lack of color does not always mean that there is no flow and in fact it should never be used as a diagnostic criteria. Just as an inside information, any time you get below three centimeters of depth, you should utilize the lowest possible Doppler frequency you have due to attenuation to obtain any kind of Doppler frequency shift. Color noise. Color where there is no flow any moving structure can cause a Doppler shift and therefore color noise. Structures near the heart exhibit artifactual color noise all the time. So if you're looking at the left lobe of the liver, you can expect that there's going to be some color there because the heart is right next to it causing it to move. Movement of the transducer also can cause color noise. We call this a flash artifact. Filters can help decrease the noise, but they don't always eliminate it. Let's look at the third situation. Color noise 
color where there is no flow. In this case, this is a clinical brewery. When the physician puts his stethoscope on the patient's ICA, he hears a trill sound and the patient comes in. That's called a brewery. What's happening is tissue next to the stenosis is actually vibrating. And so we pick that up with our color Doppler as color noise. Aliasing, especially in color, is one of the most complicated effects to try to understand or correct. It's related to the flow velocity and pulse repetition frequency. If the pulse repetition frequency is below the Nyquist frequency, aliasing will occur. This will cause the wrong color to appear where color is faster. If the velocity is just above the Nyquist limit, the flow will appear to be slow in the opposite direction. Even faster flow will show up as brighter in the other color. And that concludes our review of ultrasound physics. I hope you found this useful and I hope you have a great day. Bye.